So good afternoon, everyone. I hope that you can hear me okay. Uh, thank you for those that were able to log in early during our coffee and chat time. We were able to get uh, to know a little bit of um, one of our participants from the Klamath area. So thank you for that. And as I just shared a few uh, moments ago that we're starting to get folks starting to log in, log into our uh, B And just to give folks a little bit of guidance for this afternoon's session, I just wanted to share with you that our fall gathering came from the wishes from our behavioral health aid student. And I just wanted to give a special acknowledgement to Katie to help coordinate this, the, uh, the theme, or, you know, and the talking topics for, uh, for our time together. Um, she was able to gather information from them, you know, from what they're wanting to learn, what are they craving to, to be exposed to, uh, what are our community members doing out there currently that is working for them. And so the purpose of these gatherings is to provide that engaging workforce development activities, along with supporting our students who are completing their courses who are already providing work within the community communities, those who are interested in the field. Uh, this is also information for our community members and anyone wanting to know about what the behavioral health aid program is about. So again, today is a beautiful example of us coming together to practice our traditions with passing on our knowledge. have a brief history with the guidance and the support of the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, known as ANTHC, our behavioral health aid program adopted their process. And since 2018, our program has collaborated with our behavioral health aid work group as they provide guidance. Uh, within the leadership, they have not only streamlined the program, the education and the certificate components, they also, they also acknowledge the value our elders, our mentors, and our curators assist in the success of the program. So this is the reason why we're here today, for everyone to be involved in this new pathway for our trauma-informed providers, along with helping individuals identify and achieve their career and educational goals while serving their communities. Just wanted to share a brief overview of our agenda for today and tomorrow. And I hope that provided a little bit of guidance for this afternoon. And so what I'm hoping to ask for is if there's someone out there who's willing to take that healthy risk and share an opening blessing. Is there a volunteer out there? Good afternoon, Tanya. This is Marilyn. Hi, Marilyn. I can do a blessing for us. Get us started. Thank you. And I would just ask that everybody join in this blessing in your own way. And we respect everyone in your own traditions and ways of prayer. So join us today in asking our Heavenly Father for a blessing for each and every one of us that is joining us today to share in the information and the wisdom that each one of us have with each other and help our communities. And we ask a blessing for all of our communities to be safe and the blessing for our leaders that they make the hard decisions to protect all of our people in our community. And I ask 
that the blessing for the families that have losses on this time, that they need the strength that they need to get through this hard time. And, and all of those communities that have those that are not well today, we, we bless and ask that the Heavenly Father to help all of us and protect us from the COVID and the spread of the COVID in our communities. And we ask all of these things in your name. Amen. Hello, Maya. Thank you, Marilyn. And our past events, our past Zoom events, uh, one of our staff members have has uh, provided a great land acknowledgement. And I'm glad that uh, she's willing to carry that on with our event today. So I'm asking for Donica Brown to share in with our land acknowledgement. Sure, thanks, Tanya. Um, so, you know, we always uh, do these land acknowledgements and I think that sometimes it feels somewhat tokenizing, um, but we also just wanna acknowledge that, you know, our ancestors um, and you know, the spirits of these lands are important to acknowledge and to show respect to. So um, I've been, I, I participated in um, an event with uh, Robert Johnson and he did this land acknowledgement. So I'm just been kind of, I pinched his land acknowledgement. I've been doing it, but I always give him some, you know, respect because I learned it from him. So I hope that, uh, I hope that I do this land acknowledgement, uh, some honor, but so what we're going to do is uh, I'm just going to invite uh, everyone to just get comfortable and um, seated um, or standing, however, just however you're uh, in the space, but I want you to invite you to, you know, if you are able to physically able to put your feet solidly on the ground. And just take a moment um, to feel that, that sacred energy of Mother Earth coming up wherever you are at um, in this time and in this place. So just imagine that really beautiful, healing, caring, nurturing energy coming up through the ground and take a deep breath. So I'd like you to imagine um, where you're at in this time and place in the lands that you're currently occupying. And just take a deep breath. And I'd like for you to slowly imagine um, what this place was like pre-colonization, prior to colonial contact. Imagine the land that you're sitting on Imagine what it smells like, what it feels like on this cool September afternoon. Imagine the wind blowing or the stillness of the air. Are you near some water or are you in the desert? Are you by the ocean or by the river or in the mountains? Take a moment just to experience this place in time. And take a deep breath in. Now I'd like to invite you to imagine the original people of the land that you're on. Think about how they use this space what kind of dwellings they have, how are they cooking food, how are they enjoying the spaces, are they fishing, are they gathering mussels, are they hunting, are they picking berries, pulling up roots, Imagine the people and what they're doing, how they're interacting with the land, with the space, with the water, with the fire, with the dwellings. 
What are they doing? How are they interacting with each other? What are the men doing? What are the women doing? What are our two spirit relatives doing? Imagine the children, the laughter and the play, how they're interacting with the land, how they're interacting with the adults. Imagine what the elders are doing, how they're using this space and this time and this place. Now I just want to invite you to just sit with that just for a few moments. And with that, I would like to invite you to thank those ancestors for letting you visit that place and that time. And I want to invite you to slowly come back to this time and this place. And we want to acknowledge that we are on the occupied territory of the Multnomah people. Chinook people who are still fighting for their recognition and their sovereignty in this place, in this world. And we wanna send out our love and gratitude, not only to uh, the living ancestors um, and the past ancestors, but also to the land and the water and the fish and the birds and the bees and all the little beings and creatures. So we wanna thank them as well in this space and this time. With that, I want to thank you all for coming and sharing the space. I wish we could be sharing our sacred breath together, um, but we make um, we make do with uh, our virtual worlds. And I hope you got some grounding and some um, kind of centering from that uh, land acknowledgement exercise. And I want to thank Tanya for asking me to do this. And I wanna thank my relative, Robert Johnson for sharing uh, this activity with us today. So thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Lamaye. Thank you, Danica. What I'd like to do is I'm sharing my agenda for today. And hopefully you can see that on your screen. And next on our agenda is, um, Carrie Sampson Samuels. She is the uh, CHAP director here at the Northwest Portland Air and Health Board. And she want, and I asked her to provide a welcome to everyone. It looks all together. We have about 57 folks on today's link. Thank you for those who have taken, you know, your val valuable time out to uh, spend the afternoon with us. So thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Carrie Sampson Samuels. My Indian name is Sue Senmai, and I'm the chap director at the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board. I'm also a member of the Umatilla, Walla Walla, and Cayuse tribes, also known as the Confederated Tribes of Umatilla. So we've been looking very forward to this event, I would say since the day the last event ended back in June. Uh, we as a team have, uh, have felt so much valuable uh, knowledge and insight from bringing, bringing all of you together and um, are looking forward to continuing to do this um, here on. I wanna note that this event that you all are attending today is brought to you by the Tribal Community Health Provider Project at the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board. And this project is essentially the umbrella project for three new health providers roles in the Northwest, the dental health aides, behavioral health aides, and community health aides. Uh, one thing that sets these professions aside uh, from many mainstream health providers is its close connection and understanding of our tribal communities, and most importantly, this close connection and teachings from our elders. Uh, we feel so privileged to share this space with many of our wisest elders, our knowledge holders and culture keepers, and realize that this healing space wouldn't be possible without the past presenters and our current presenters this week 
that so graciously and humbly share their stories and experiences and teachings with all of us who um, eagerly want to learn. I want to also encourage all of you, um, just as if we were in person, if you see a familiar face on your screen or a familiar name to utilize the Zoom chat and connect with them, say hello, just as we might do if we, again, were in person and, and it was coffee time, break time, snack time, and you ran into someone that you knew. I know in the past, we've actually had uh, relatives that have connected on this forum and said, oh, you're my cousin. And so it's always just a really great thing to see when we're in these spaces. I also want to acknowledge that this event wouldn't be possible without the funding support from the Washington Healthcare Authority and their staff that believe in this work that we are all doing. So with that, Katsi Ayao, thank you uh, to all of you have who have chosen this space to heal and share your stories um, over the next two days. We are truly honored. Thank you. Malamaya, thank you, Carrie. Thank you for those warm words. It really does um, uh, bring really good comfort with all the planning that we've done with these meetings. So thank you for that. During our summer gathering, uh, we provided t-shirts in with our swag bags. And uh, I asked for random volunteers to share a selfie, you know, with them wearing their t-shirts. And so I received a handful of beautiful pictures. And one person who shared their picture stood out in my memory. I gravitated to that photo because I was intrigued with their smile. The smile expressed gratitude, a sense of calming, grounding, and generosity. And she was posing next to another photo, so I decided to, to, to take a risk and just reach out and ask. And the one thing that I learned during this lesson was when you ask, you actually get a chance to hear someone's story and learn a little bit more about them. And so today, I'm proud to introduce today's keynote speaker, Martina Gordon. She is a member of the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. And this afternoon, Martina comes to us from her home reservation in the Pendleton area, and she is currently working with the Umatilla Tribal Court System. She comes from a family of 10 children. She comes from a strong and resilient mother. Martina has been on a path of self-restoration and encourages others to return to their roots and heal from generational trauma. So I'm proud to welcome Martina. Thank you, Tanya, for the beautiful introduction today. Tatsalah, Tatsalah, good afternoon. My name, like she said, is Martina Gordon. The name my ancestors know me by is Kapoi, which is my mother's childhood name. My mother is Atwai Shawshwinat Mai, Kathleen Gordon, and she was my elder and my knowledge holder and my culture keeper. And I carry her in my heart always. My father was Robert Gordon. He was born in High River, Canada, and he is also carried in my heart. They have both passed on. I do have the photo that Tanya was talking about, so I'd like to share it really quick with you. This is, if it'll come in. Yeah, that's my mother. And um, that smile in this picture brings me comfort daily. I look at it all the time. And growing up, I would hear my mother speaking our language and I took comfort in the sound of our language. And um, it saddens me that I didn't learn that from her. I don't know the reasons why, all of the reasons why I didn't learn that from her. And I have carried guilt about it and have been shamed from people for not learning that from her when I had the chance. However, I am taking classes now from our tribe, which I am grateful for. And if you have that opportunity, I definitely encourage you to do that as well. If you have any language classes available to you, we are doing them virtual, just like this gathering today. And it's just wonderful to hear those words again and have them wash over me. And that familiarity that I, that I had with when my mother was here, it just brings all those emotions back and just, hearing her voice saying those words and it's absolutely like waterfalls flowing over 
over you to hear those again. And it brings a lot of comfort to me as well. Um, when I was a child and we were at the longhouse, I had an opportunity to get my Indian name and I was extremely naughty and ran off and started playing at the neighborhood uh, playground and totally missed that opportunity to get my Indian name. And when I was a senior in high school, my mother approached me again and gave me the opportunity again, which is probably unheard of, to get my Indian name. And unfortunately, I was in a religious sect that felt that my culture was against biblical laws. And so I declined at the request of my pastor again to not get my Indian name. And I know that broke my mother's heart. And it's something that I carry with me daily as well. But I let that motivate me and not shame me per se, but to motivate me to be a better person. I have since left that um, religious sect and a lot of love and healing happened between my mother and I. There was some distance between us because of that. But after that, there was just this healing bridge and we became very close and she instilled in me the resiliency that she had that she went through with her childhood, growing up in a Catholic school, saying that her language was forbidden and thank God she didn't lose it. She actually became a, a master language speaker for our tribe and has recordings of her and other elders uh, preserving our language. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, I take my children to community events to keep them involved as, but COVID has put a stymie on that. So I take advantage of virtual sessions like this just to keep my mind and brain active and going in other people's knowledge that they have and to just continue to grow. And it's very important to take advantage of these opportunities when they come to us so that we can have open hearts and learn from others. It is so important to do that. And my mom taught me that as well. She um, passed away in 2009 and it seems like it was just yesterday. And I just hope that each of us, no matter what path that we are on right now, that we can pick up the pieces of our culture and start learning if we didn't take advantage of that when we were younger or we didn't have that opportunity due to adoption. I come from a place where I come across a lot of children who were adopted out into non-native families and didn't have the opportunity to learn that when they were children. And I encourage you to do that now, pick up where you are at now to learn. And because that connection is so important and it helps with uh, our mental health. I believe it strongly uh, assists us in uh, the positive aspects. And I take my children to gather huckleberries in the mountains and every opportunity that I have, I want my children to be able to partake in even if they don't particularly understand the value of it right now, I know they will when they are older and hopefully they will pass it on to their children as well. So I shared my story um, just to say this, is to just start where you are and hopefully someone rises up before you that you are able to ask questions and, and find out what the, um, what the culture is that you perhaps have missed out on, but not to feel guilt because of it. Guilt has its place, but not to bring us down. It can be a great motivator, which it has been for me. And I just encourage you to find your path back to your culture. And um, I'm trying to find my place in my community. Um, and I encourage this not to be a shameful experience, but to have an open mind and an open heart to others. And hopefully someone, like I said, will rise up in your life that you're able to trust and able to glean that knowledge from. Because without each other, we are nothing. And I just want us to all be um, open to each other. And I have an email address. You're welcome to email. I'm not an expert by any means, but I, I am um, there. if you need someone to talk to. And um, 
I just want to glean knowledge from others. I'm thankful for this gathering that we have today. And I just want us to all have open hearts and open minds towards each other. Thank you. Ketsi Aoyao. Yao. Hello, Yang. Martina, thank you. Um, just the mere fact that when, uh, when Katie and I reached out to Martina and we asked her if she'd be willing to be a keynote at our gathering, she didn't hesitate one, one second. And so it's people like Martina who are willing to, to share and just be available um, does wonders. And I know that um, our students will appreciate that and our community members appreciate that. So thank you for spending your afternoon with us, Martina. And thank you for those that um, have come on. It looks like we've got 60 folks who have uh, registered for our link this afternoon. And um, I just wanted to give a quick announcement that uh, for those who pre-registered for this event, you will be receiving a goodie bag. Uh, but due to uh, some uh, shipping delays, uh, folks locally in the Portland area should be receiving uh, their packages today. And then folks in the Washington and Idaho, Idaho area should be receiving them tomorrow. But, uh, but like I said, for those, for those who pre-registered, you will be receiving some really awesome items. And then uh, just to kind of name off a couple of the things that you you'll be receiving, uh, again, uh, for those who attended last time, you'll be getting another face mask. We also have a stress reliever, a tote bag, uh, chocolate, a spa kit. We also have a cutting board and apron and uh, some a colored pencil set. And also with your packet, you'll also be receiving some really good printed material. And included in that are some really nice wellness activity events for you know coloring. So thanks to Katie for sharing that link. And um, but yeah, um, unfortunately, we weren't able to get those out to you sooner, but you will be receiving your, your swag bag. Um, so just to kind of start, just to kick off our learning session this afternoon, I'd like to introduce our next presenter. Alexis Contreras is a member of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. She joined the National Indian Child Welfare Team back in the fall of 2011 working on numerous projects ranging from juvenile justice to reducing disparities in the child welfare system. Alexis values Nicholas philosophy and role to help guide the community process and activities in which they can draw on the wisdom and assets they have to improve and embrace community strengths and well being throughout Indian country. So I'm proud to um, announce Alexis. Thank you, Tanya. Um, and thank you, Martina, for your words, too. Um, as someone, my name is Alexis Contreras. I'll introduce myself again. I'm a member of the Grand Round Tribe. And um, as a member of a tribe that was, that tribe was um, terminated, um, it is a tribe that we are relearning some of our, some of our traditions. We're having to go back and learn our songs. And now songs are coming into our communities and dances are coming back into our communities. So I appreciate your words, Martina. You know, I grew up in um, San Francisco kind of as an urban Indian going to uh, Stanford powwow and the powwows. And so it was um, a lot of fun, but I didn't know a lot about my own culture and my own roots here in the Northwest until I became an adult. And so now I get to raise my son, um, sharing those practices with him and learning with him as well. So thank you, Martina. Um, I just wanted to thank Tanya and Katie for inviting me here to speak with you guys today. Um, I'm going to be talking about the relational worldview model. Um, it's a indigenous framework that we that um, I'm going to share a PowerPoint with you. If I can share my screen, okay. Does everybody see that? Great. I see head nodding. Okay. 
So um, what I thought when I was talking with Tanya and, and Katie was um, it sounds like maybe some of you have had some experience with the relational worldview model and maybe some of you have not. Um, but I really was thinking about how we could make this, um, how to talk about it and how it could be useful and how it could be a tool for you to use in, in your own practice, in your own work and in your own life. And so what I wanted to just start with was kind of what we see in mainstream um, society, which is the linear worldview. So this is kind of this mainstream thought, which there's a cause, there's an effect, and um, it really kind of values timelines, it, it values facts, it values material, it values authority. And so this is the... This is the mainstream world view that we are, as Native people, um, doesn't really work for us so much. And a lot of the systems that we work in, that we live in, um, go, are based off of this world view. And so we see this in social work as this social history. And a lot of times, I know a lot of you are part of the behavioral aid health um, behavioral health aid program. And so a lot of us see like the social history, the presenting problem, there's an assessment and then there's a treatment and you're hoping to get some, some kind of outcome from that. And so that's a very linear way of thinking about things. And um, so we really wanted to, I really wanted to share with you a little bit more about the relational worldview model and kind of this indigenous framework for using in your own practices and for using in your own lives as well. And so the relational worldview is a model that's in a constant state of flux as we go through time. Um, the aspects change and they're all interrelated. So it's a way to explain this human behavior with the idea of balance as maintaining your health and well being. Um, so being out of balance, it might promote dis-ease in yourself or in your family. Um, so as helpers, as healers, um, we are wanting to understand those problems through balances, imbalances in a person's world. So really in this model, the important question is how do we restore that balance? And that's more relative, uh, re relevant than why did something happen? So in this relational worldview model, it really values those natural patterns. It values wisdom. It values things happening on their own time. It values collectivism. And that's very different from that mainstream model that we um, see every day. So just looking at the relational worldview on an individual or family level, we see these four quadrants. So we have the context, the mind, the body, and the spirit. In that context quadrant, this is where your culture is. This is your family, your work, economics. This is the social history. In the mind quadrant, this is where we have our thinking processes, our self-esteem, our memories, and our emotions. In the body quadrant is our biochemistry, genetics, our health, our health status, our sleep state, and um, you know whether we're using or abusing substances. And then in the spirit quadrant is the innate and positive, innate positive, learned positive, innate negative, learned negative. And so this can be seen sometimes. Uh, innate positive as that um, good spirits or maybe good luck learn positive are those are our ceremonies that we that we take part of to um, keep our spirit in balance um, innate negative could be um, bad spirits or bad luck and then the learn negative are those lessons that or bad medicine maybe and so we look at this relational worldview this model right here is showing you the individual and family level. And so I didn't include a slide for 
the organizational or tribal level, but you can also use this model um, on a on a larger level for a community as well. And in that con in that model, the context becomes the environment, the mind becomes the infrastructure, the body becomes the resources, and the spirit becomes the mission. And so, just like in ourselves, if we have balance between these four quadrants, then we can be seen as having a functional organization or in well uh, of a functioning program, maybe. And so I thought we could talk a little bit about intentional resilience. And we're going to use the relational model to come up with a plan for ourselves in keeping ourselves um, in balance and so that we may serve the families that we're working with in a good way and we can be more effective in our practice. And so, um, so intentional resilience, this is just the definition here, um, intentional, it's done on purpose. Uh, resilience, the capacity to quickly recover. This is our toughness, our ability to spring back. And um, I actually borrowed some of this information from our curriculum that we have at NICWA called Working with Substance Abusing Families. And within that curriculum, there's a lesson that's called Healing the Healers. And so I thought that was a perfect um, lesson to kind of um, to talk about today to help with intentional resilience for ourselves and in our roles with working with clients. Um, if you are if you are a behavioral health aide, that you're working with people that maybe have multiple complex issues going on in their lives. And so we really need to make sure that we're um, taking care of ourselves and staying in balance so that we can do this good, challenging work. So we're gonna actively plan and engage in a holistic personalized strategies that promote balance and mitigate negative impacts of adversity. So I wanted to take a few minutes to just do a self-assessment exercise. And so I'm asking everyone to kind of think about how you're doing today and think about your state of balance. So around that circle, when we talked about the context, the mind, the body, and the spirit, think of how your balance is around that, around that um, circle. And so I want to just give you a minute, and I think I'm going to put on a timer so I can just really give you that minute to think about um, how you're feeling today. So maybe start with when you woke up. Did you wake up and hit snooze, or did you wake up and stretch? Um, and then how did you start your day? Did you eat breakfast? Did you skip breakfast? Did you have coffee? So think about how you went through your day, your morning, your afternoon, and think of how your balance is around those four quadrants. So again, I'm just going to give you one minute. Um, if we were together, we might partner up, but since we're all in this virtual setting, we're going to just kind of do this on our own. I'm going to jot down a few things about my morning and just um, on a piece of paper. And then I'll let you have one minute to just do this exercise. Okay, thank you. Um, I really, I'd love to invite anyone who'd like to, to just write in the chat or just unmute yourself and um, share um, how they're feeling if they felt they were in balance um, in those different quadrants, the mind, body, spirit, and context. Um, I'll just say for myself, um, I woke up 
somehow I changed my alarm. So it went off at 7.30 instead of seven. Um, so it was, it was odd. And I guess my body felt it too, because I woke up and I was like, what time it is, is it? I felt like it was late. Um, so I immediately was like in that kind of rushed, um, like, oh, I'm late already. <laughs> I woke up late. So um, my, my body was kind of tired just because I was, um, didn't sleep well last night. And then um, waking up and kind of jumping up wasn't really great. I usually try to stretch when I first get up. So a little out of balance, but as my day went by, I ate breakfast, I had coffee, um, I talked to my mom. And so it kind of, you know, balanced out that, that, um, that kind of stretch morning. So if anyone wants to share in the chat, you're welcome to. Um, Libby said, I began my day in a good way, but recently received news that someone close to me is struggling with unhealthy thoughts, and that concerns me a lot. Thank you for sharing that, Libby. You know, this is, um, this is why we need to do this intentional resilience is that things that happen in our lives um, and with our loved ones or with our clients, um, they affect us. We take on some of that trauma sometimes. Um, we take on that stress. And so we really need to um, be mindful and think about and intentional in um, how we are taking care of ourselves. And I'm gonna move on to the um, next part of this exercise, which I'm gonna ask everybody if they could stand up, if you can. And if you, if you can't, let me see if I can do this. And if you can't um, sit comfortably, but I just want you to, you can close your eyes if you'd like, um, and just think about your body and where the tensions in your body are. Uh, for me, I hold all my tension in my neck and my shoulders. So just maybe roll your shoulders back and relax them. And then if I can ask you to take a few deep breaths with me, um, take a, we're gonna take a big deep breath, belly breath, through our nose and then blow it out slowly. Take a deep breath in and then blow it out slowly. And then pause before we take our next breath and deep breath in. Blow it out slowly. Pause, take a deep breath in, blow it out slowly. So you can open your eyes. If you'd like if you've had your eyes closed and you can sit down if you'd like to. And um, just think about how you're feeling now. Um, Think about those quadrants, the mind, body, spirit, and context. How are you feeling now in each of those quadrants? I actually was feeling very nervous because I always get nervous when I have to present in front of people, even though we're in a virtual setting, I still get nervous every time. Um, and I actually feel a lot calmer now. So I, I feel good um, after taking those breaths. So again, if you'd like to write in the chat, you can, um, or just think to yourself about how you're feeling. Um, and then um, Coletta also wrote in the chat about how she was feeling. I think this was before the, um, before the exercise. I woke up rested and my goal today was to overcome the fear of this COVID. Our nevers have spiked in our communities. Yes. So it's been very stressful. I work at the only grocery store here in our community. So it's all around us. And so far today has been great. I have overcome the fear and 
Oops, did I move it? I have overcome the fear. Um, and it has been a great day. And then Libby says, I feel a lot better. Thank you for reminding me to breathe and doing this mini meditation exercise. Thank you. Yeah, so just um, thinking about that and taking that, taking those steps um, in your practice. So I'm gonna move on to the next um, slide here. So what that exercise was really intended to do was sh to show that we can intentionally shift the balance in our lives that to affect our health and our well being. So, if you think about it, we do it all the time. We do it naturally. Um, when we're hungry, we eat. When we're tired, we sleep. When we are feeling lonely, we seek interaction. So, when we're when we want comfort or when we're stressed, we look for. So. And then, you know, many of us use ceremony or traditional medicine also when we feel out of balance. And so this adversity, it's a normal part of our life and we're built to find balance. Um, you know, we, we face those challenges, either big or small, we're always facing challenges. So, however, the greater the stress, the more intentional we have to be to restore that balance. So you can always rely on your tribal teachings. Um, you know, those are full of intentional strategies that promote balance. So I'm sure all of you could name some in each of those quadrants. So like thinking of smudging or sweat lodges or celebrations or things in your life that you do to uh, promote balance. Um, for the sake of time, I think I'm just going to skip this slide so that we can do this um, next exercise, which is um, where we're going to kind of think about how we can intentionally build our own resilience. And then we're going to come up with a personal resilience plan. And so what I'd like you to do is to, um, if you have a piece of paper, and a pen or a pencil, just draw a circle. And I'm sorry I didn't get this in the packet as a handout, but um, draw a circle and divide it into the four quadrants, context, mind, body, spirit. And then take a couple minutes and write in each of those quadrants something that you can do to take care of yourself. So maybe it's, taking a walk one every day. Maybe it is reading a book. Maybe it's um, calling a friend um, and, or maybe it's prayer. So I just kind of gave an example from each of those quadrants that I, that I um, like to do for myself, um, but, may, but I would like you to invite everybody on this call to just take a few minutes to write down one thing, at least one thing, and you can write more if you have more, um, but one, one action that you can take in each of these quadrants so that you can um, find balance and that you can, um, when you are needing this resilience plan, you can go to it and say, what do I need to take care of myself? What do I need to take care of my mind, my body, my spirit? and the context. So go ahead and take a couple minutes and write some things down. And then maybe we can have a couple people share. And I'm also gonna write some things down. Sometimes as you're going through this exercise, you might say, oh, does this fit into context or body? Or does this fit in mind or body? Maybe it's both. Remember, this is fluid and these quadrants are just there as 
um, to help you kind of understand it, but it could overlap and they definitely interrelate as well. So I'm going to, um, I'd really love for everybody to, um, you know, if you're, you're not finished with this, come back to it and maybe finish it later. I know we don't have much time left today to talk about it, um, but I was just going to share a couple of mine. And then if anyone would like to share um, what they wrote down in their plan, um, you're welcome to as well. So I just noticed um, I just like made a circle and then wrote a few things. I don't think you can see that very well, but I'll just read them off. So um, I am noticing though, as I wrote it down, that each of my, um, the things that I wrote um, kind of fit into the context as well. And so in the mind quadrant, I said, read a book. And so um, my cousins who are, um, my sisters basically are the, those people that, um, I talk to and, um, we laugh and that gives me a lot of healing is just being around my family. And so they were talking about all these books that they were reading, that they were loving. And so we had, we we're like, Oh, book club. Like, <laughs> so then I was thinking, well, if I read a book, and then we also have a time where we can get together as a family and talk about it, then that's both the mind and context. I'm changing up the context, but I'm also um, taking care of my mind at that time. And then in the body quadrant, I put go to the gym. My son loves to go to the gym and he always invites me. And I haven't gone the last few times that he's invited me, but just knowing that I need that for my body, um, for my mental state, for my health, um, and then also for the context, because then I'm doing something with my son that is healthy. Um, I also put sweat. I haven't done a sweat in a long time, and that's something that is feels really good for my spirit. Um, it's also a way for us women to get together and just have that, like share that strength and share that time of healing together. And so that's um, just a few things that I wrote down um, for my intentional resilience plan. And so I hope that you're able to use these in um, your work that, or for yourselves, but that it helps for you to keep your balance and take care of yourself in your work that you do. And I think we just have a few minutes left questions or if people want to share what they what they said what they added into their plan so let me see I don't know if there's anything in the chat um the breath was amazing and a simple thing to do right so if you can have just when you feel like you're sitting I especially think that right now we're on zoom all the time um we're sitting a lot more we're more sedentary even than we were before and so making sure that you're standing up you're putting your shoulders back you're breathing and taking that breath and that that taking care of yourself in those ways and then let me see so riley said regular meditation helps me with all four quadrants that's great so it does, it really helps with your mind, it helps with your body, your spirit, and the context. So it changes your the environment around you even. 
Hi, Alexis, in the chat box, there was a question about if you can describe the context quadrants. Yeah. I'm going to go back to that slide. Here we go. Yeah, so the um, the context is kind of like, what is that? So your economic status could be part of the context. So, you know, are you um, are you financially stable or is that something that maybe you're not, you don't have financial stability. So it could um, be a stressor on your con on the context of your of your life, your social history. So um, a lot of us share a similar social history. A lot of um, Native people share a similar social history. So in my family, um, my grandma, uh, when the tribe was terminated um, and during the relocation program, she was sent she went down to San Francisco and went to beauty school. And so that's where she met my grandpa and started their family. And that's how we ended up in San Francisco as urban Indians, you know. So your social history, um, uh, the context is really all those things that surround you in your life your community that you're a part of, your culture that you interact with, um, the people that are in your life, your family, your friends, your peers, your coworkers. Yeah, thank you for asking. So Alexis, um, I've used the relational worldview both in my personal and professional life. And so when I think of context, I kind of use, I kind of start off with this tool with the context part you know it kind of uh kind of gives me that direction on where i need to find the balance with my mind body and spirit so that's kind of like how i kind of start off when i'm using this assessment yeah thank you and it could be something small too like right now um you know i'm we're all kind of sitting somewhere comfortably, hopefully, at a desk um, in front of a computer screen. We're going to, our context is different than if we're just lounging in the living room or if we're outside nature. So kind of context, like Tanya said, starting where you are with the context. Are there any other questions? And so I know some folks are asking if uh, this PowerPoint will be shared, and uh, we definitely would like to share this, Alexis, if that's okay. Great. I definitely can share it, yeah. Okay. And I just wanted to say thank you once again for um, sharing this valuable tool. This is a, a product that uh, Mr. Terry Cross has created many years ago, and um, this is a great tool to help restore balance within, you know, on an individual level, family level, organization level, um, but also too, it can be a, a collective process or an individual process. So this has been a great tool for me, like I shared, you know, on a personal and professional level. And I just wanted to share with folks that uh, NICWA, the National Indian Child Welfare Association, also has a YouTube uh, channel and I just wanted to share that Alexis has um, has been highlighted. And um, so for those who want to hear a little bit more about about Alexis and others, they do have a digital story on YouTube. So when you have a moment to check that out, that was very helpful for me to get to know a little bit more about Alexis. And so um, once again, thank you for spending your afternoon with us. Thank you. And so if anyone has any questions, uh, please use the chat box and you can also send me an email and uh, we'll be sharing uh, uh, the PowerPoint and uh, for any future questions and answers, uh, we'll also share um, Alexis's email. And so what I'd like to do is hand over the uh, floor to Katie. Hi everyone. Um,
I'm going to introduce our next presenter. Uh, Riley Fishborn has been working as an ally to the Native community at Native American Youth and Family Center since March of 2017, where he holds the title of Homeless Youth Services Coordinator. He also provided culturally specific services early in his career at AmeriCorps Vista and has over 15 years of experience in various child and family service capacities. I was able to work with Riley at NEA and see him work as an advocate, healer, giver, and friend for youth and community members. He works so hard to provide support and we are very appreciative to have him here today. Um, as a friend of Riley's, I am just really um, honored that he could share his knowledge with us. So I'm gonna pass it over to Riley. Thank you so much for that introduction, Katie. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, great. Let me uh, try to share my screen here quickly. I'm a bit of a PowerPoint novice, so forgive me for that. All right, can everyone see that? Wonderful. So as Katie said, my name is Riley and I'll be presenting today on overcoming barriers for homeless youth. I use he, him pronouns. And uh, as Katie touched upon, um, I have a bachelor's degree from Evergreen State College in liberal arts. And I also worked in uh, social services, providing culturally specific services before NEA at, um, at the New England Farm Workers Council as a volunteer with AmeriCorps VISTA program. And I've been working in youth education services in one capacity or another for over 15 years now. Um, my title at NEA is Homeless Youth Services Coordinator, and I've been in that program since I started at NEA back in 2017. So I'll be moving through a lot of information and trying to do so quickly so I can cover everything. But uh, as with the previous presentation, I will leave some space for questions at the end. So a quick overview, our staff uh, connects youth to on-site and mobile screening for shelter services. Um, my program, in addition to myself, staffs three case managers who hold a caseload of 20 youth. And to be eligible for our program, they need to be between the ages of 16 and 24 and meet the county's definition of unstably housed. And thanks to a lot of hard work by the folks at NEA, that definition of unstably housed is flexible and can be applied to many of the ways in which homelessness manifests in the native community, including couch surfing and other youth who are doubled up or tripled up with family, but may not necessarily self-identify as homeless. Um, we also staff a youth parent support specialist in the program. Approximately 50% of the homeless youth we serve are actually parents themselves. So that's a critically important service. And our youth parent support specialist provides additional advocacy as well as access to funding for parenting supplies and resources. We staff a peer mentor so that youth can receive additional services uh, and additional support from someone in their own age group. We staff an alcohol and drug specialist and a direct services manager, both of whom are licensed counselors. We serve Multnomah County, but can also provide assistance to clients relocating out of our service area. So critically, if a youth finds a way to house themselves and it's outside the county or even outside the state, we can still help them with that. And uh, in the past, we've used funding to help youth with everything from buying luggage to buying train tickets um, with the understanding that they are relocating to a permanent housing solution. Um, we do not do outreach in my program. Uh, we receive a lot of word of mouth referrals from the native community, as well as elsewhere, elsewhere in the homeless youth continuum, which includes our partnering agencies, New Avenues for Youth, Outside In, and Janus Youth. So those organizations conduct screenings of homeless youth into the homeless youth continuum. And if in the process of those screenings, they discover that youth are interested in culturally specific services, 
or just interested in receiving services away from downtown, which can be a, a dangerous or trig triggering place to be for homeless youth. Uh, then in those cases, those youth will get referred out to us where they can uh, receive case management at NAA and hopefully be a lot more comfortable. Um, part of the way our staff connects youth to the local Native community and neighborhood resources are through uh, the Native American Legal Aid Services Program, um, the Native American Rehabilitation Association, or NARA, and the Native Wellness Institute. Um, Another way that we uh, connect youth to the Native community is through housing programs that have a Native preference. So for example, Nasika Alehi and the forthcoming Mamuk Tokati and Kasan Shako Haas are actually affordable housing communities in Portland that are legally able to prioritize applications from Native, uh, from native youth. So we encourage youth to apply for those opportunities, not only as a way of obtaining affordable housing, but also by uh, also as an opportunity to, to become a part of a another native community. So case managers will meet with our homeless youth two to four times per month to build a relationship. And uh, that's the minimum engagement guideline that we hold youth to at the time of screening. And it can vary wildly from one youth to another. Some youth need very little assistance in order to achieve self-sustainability. Uh, self um, something as ephemeral as payment of a security deposit could be all they really need to get where they need to go. Other youth require much more of a daily presence. Um, we do close youth out of our program without meaningful engagement in a 90 day period so we can keep our wait list moving and make sure that the folks who do need services are getting those. We keep meetings between case managers and homeless youth informal. And a lot of times those take place on our beautiful campus with our nature slough, on our basketball courts, um, anywhere the youth is comfortable. But we do have the ability as case managers to travel into the community and meet in low barrier settings such as local libraries that are easy for youth to get to. Um, the important thing is that youth have agency over when, where, and how they meet with their case managers. Um, we believe that youth are the experts in their own lives, and that is a core component of assertive engagement. All of our staff are trained in the assertive engagement service model, which draws from various philosophies, including strength-based approach, trauma-informed care, motivational interviewing, empathy, holding ambivalence, unconditional positive regard, and many other components. A little more about trauma-informed care. All of our agency staff are trained in providing trauma-informed care, and this is especially important for homeless youth services programming because homeless youth are sharing their story in a way that leaves them vulnerable to having their past traumas activated. Um, a lot of what we talk about in our regular meetings with clients and even upon that first meeting when they're getting screened in can be very sensitive and personal information. And we know that not a lot of productive work gets done and certainly few positive relationships are built when a youth's trauma is activated. In addition to training all of our staff, NEA regularly undergoes organizational reassessments to ensure a baseline of competencies and create a culture of wellness and self-care. And to create a safe environment for everyone in our space, uh, youth, clients, and staff as well. And this affects everything from the signage and the lighting in our space, which we try to keep low to give a less institutionalized feel, uh, to the foods we offer, the furniture we have available to them, and the way we organize the space to, to leave it open for them, as well as a play space for any children they may bring into the program, all in the name of making them feel as comfortable as possible while they share their stories. Additionally, all homeless youth services staff are trained in the relational worldview service model, 
Uh, we heard a lot about the relational worldview model earlier from Alexis, but to briefly review, uh, it was developed by the National Indian Child Welfare Association, or NICWA, in the 1980s. And uh, designer Terry Cross, who meets with our staff regularly, describes it as, quote, a reflection of the native thought process and concept of balance as the basis for health, which I find to be a, a pretty uh, elegant brief explanation of the re relational worldview model. Um, basically, it's an alternative to the linear worldview, which is rooted in European and mainstream American thought. And the way it's applied in our program is via the medicine wheel, mind, body, spirit, and context quadrants. And of course, we seek to address homelessness, but we also want to address other areas of their life and other barriers that contribute indirectly to their homelessness. And the way it was put to me by my first supervisor at NEA was that we look to restore balance rather than treating the person or just trying to fix the problems of the youth. And I find that to be an important distinction. So we do individualized goal plans with all of our youth and set goals in each of the four quadrants. We use a tool called, called SMART Goals, and that's an acronym uh, which stands for Specific, Measurable, Attainable, Relevant, and Time-Based. So goals which are developed collaboratively between case manager and youth are meant to meet all five of those criteria and to be regularly reviewed to hold the youth accountable and keep them on target. Goals, as, as we just saw, don't always fit very neatly into the four quadrants, but the important thing is to, to get you thinking about the relational worldview model and specifically how each of their goals impact one another and ultimately impact their housing stability. Goal planning can ask a lot of critical thought of the youth, but first we try to establish trust and build a relationship with lots of fun and culturally specific activities and events, including the annual powwow, our monthly culture nights, and weekly rec groups specifically for HYS youth. And those can be everything from beating and regalia making to bicycle rides and movie tickets. And as we build relationships through these experiences, we try to really emphasize the importance of wraparound services and getting youth involved in multiple programs that the agency has to offer. So ultimately, we want to build youth's awareness of all the resources that are available to them in the community and empower them to access those resources. But first, we try to make sure that they are connecting to all the resources that are available to them right down our halls. So connecting youth to resources starts with in-agency referrals. Excuse me. Some of the most common in-agency referrals uh, that we make to and from homeless youth services include the Healing Circle, which provides services and case management to survivors of domestic violence, which can be a direct cause of much of the youth homelessness that we see. And case managers strive to be informed on all DV services that are available in the community so that we can provide youth with access to all of the options that are available to them. And again, let them be the experts in their own lives. But if we can get them the services they need in-house at NEA, then we try to do that so they can access in a way that is convenient, that we know to be culturally specific and in a space with which they are already comfortable. Another very common referral for us is to the College and Career Center, which provides assistance with FAFSA applications, scholarship opportunities, resume building workshops, coordinated visits to college campuses and career fairs, as well as referrals to technical or trade schools to get youth directly into higher wage employment, which is, of course, very important to sustaining independent housing. And uh, you know, many of the youth who come to us are not ready for independent housing, but we like to get them thinking about their goals beyond housing, where they would like to go to school, what they would like to do for a career, and that's work we can begin with them right away. We also have our very own alternative high school for students of color on campus called the Many Nations Academy. If students of the Many Nations Academy are struggling due to housing insecurity, which is very understandable, then Many Nations Academy staff will refer them upstairs to have a talk with me in my office 
um, very short walk away. And meanwhile, if any youth become aware of NEA firstly through my program and later identify education as one of their goals, then I can help get them enrolled in the Many Nations Academy very quickly and easily. Um, or other education and uh, GED programs available in the community. There is a special program at NEA for youth that have been involved in foster care, and we can work with that program to get homeless youth access to the additional advocacy that's available to former foster youth, as well as access to special vouchers such as the Family Unification Pro uh, excuse me, Family Unification Program Youth Voucher to subsidize their housing or to the New Doors program, which is a shared housing program in Southeast Portland where former foster youth can live for just $25 a month while addressing their long-term barriers to independent housing. The aforementioned Culture Night events, which are hosted monthly, are another great way for youth to come in, have some fun, have a meal, get to know their case manager, but also meet staff from other programs at NEA, learn what is available, what is out there, and get connected. Elsewhere at NEA and in the community at large, we seek to connect youth with the most helpful and appropriate resources that are available to them. And some of the common barriers that are faced by many of the homeless youth that we see include a lack of basic resources, uh, food, clothing, shelter, hygiene products, and childcare supplies. Basic resources that we try to keep always available are our food pantry, clothing closet, access to computers or showers, um, and my office in particular is always stocked with condoms and some of the most commonly requested hygiene products like soap, shampoo, deodorant, and tampons. If youth are busy trying to get their basic needs met, then it is very difficult to focus on larger goals like sustainable independent housing. Um, physical and or mental health needs. Also very difficult to achieve self-sufficiency if you aren't first able to address physical injuries or disabilities. We can connect youth to specialists in the Oregon Health Plan for access to all of their health needs. And mental health is a big part of that. Mental health needs range from counseling and therapy to hospitalization, which typically happens in Portland at the Unity Center for Behavioral Health. Um, Obviously the pandemic ha has impacted that a great deal and there aren't as many mental health resources available to youth as we would like, but we try to make sure that youth know what to do to get on wait lists, to be seen by a counselor, to be seen by a therapist, to be established as a, as a, um, a client of a primary care physician. Criminal record, debt, or past eviction are huge barriers for a lot of our youth, specifically those who are almost ready for independent housing. Um, we can connect youth to legal aid resources. And again, there aren't as many of these available as we need, but they do exist. And the Native American Program of Legal Aid Services of Oregon is a big one. Um, I've also connected youth to the Metropolitan Public Defender's Office and SOAR, which is an organization that provides free legal aid. So the resources are uh, not as abundant as we one day hope to see, but they are out there and we try to increase homeless youth's awareness of those resources. If youth are ready to apply for housing, um, independent housing in an apartment or home, then um, in addition to covering their application fee and move-in costs, we often write letters of advocacy that can sometimes lead to successful appeals of youth applications that are otherwise rejected based on those legal barriers. Um, many of our youth are fully employed and capable of paying the rent in an apartment, but rejected in their initial application for housing based on very old criminal records. So we try to get them in touch if possible with legal aid service providers who can work with them on expungement. There's also a tremendously helpful resource available in the community called RentWell. 
And this is a course that is offered by the Homeless Youth Continuum, as well as by private organizations who charge a registration fee for youth who want to take the class. I'm always eager to pay that registration fee for any of my clients who want to take the class because I know how helpful it can be. This is a class that usually takes place over the course of five or six weeks. It's offered at a variety of days and times so that youth with different work schedules can accommodate it. And if youth pass the rent well class, then in addition to learning a lot of information that will be new to them if they are first time renters, they'll also receive a rent well certificate. And here in Multnomah County, if a housing provider rents a unit to someone with a rent well certificate and that leasee is eventually evicted, the housing provider is reimbursed by the county for that. So that is a huge incentive for any of these Portland landlords to take a chance on a youth that they might not otherwise be willing to house because of past eviction, because of debt, or because of a criminal record. Um, if expungement is not an option, a rent well certificate is a, uh, a tremendous counterweight to that. Lack of sexual education and wellness is a need that I personally identified as overlapping on many of our caseloads. So we started hosting an in-program workshop um, initially called Sex Ed and later changed to Healthy Relationships to reflect the fact that in addition to protection against unplanned pregnancies and STIs, which make it very difficult to achieve self-sustainability, uh, we also cover the basics of giving consent and asking for consent and maintaining healthy relationships of all kinds. Um, lack of financial literacy is a, a, an issue that affects a lot of our homeless youth. And so we also begin offering workshops called financial wellness where youth can learn Everything from addressing debt and raising their credit score to applying for loans and balancing a checkbook, all crucially important skills to have to not only attain housing, but to maintain housing. Lack of education, unemployment or underemployment, domestic violence and abuse, these are all huge issues that I've touched on uh, already. There are resources both at NAIA and elsewhere in the community. And again, we try to make sure that youth know about all of them so they can make an informed decision on what's best for them to pursue. And uh, we don't just leave them to it. At that point, once they have made their decision about which resource they want to access, we help them do it. We can help make the calls. We can, pandemic notwithstanding, provide them with transportation to and from these many offices and uh, help them cut through a lot of the, the red tape and the many pieces of paperwork that they're asked to do to access all these resources. Um, SNAP, WIC, and TANF, these are resources that we hope all of our clients are receiving if they're eligible for it. Lack of transportation is a huge issue that affects a lot of our youth and so we connect them to a program called the Honored Citizen Program that's offered by TriMet. This is a program that is very relevant to a lot of our community members and specifically homeless youth who can't reach self-sustainability because they have no way of getting to and from these many appointments with their case managers, with employers, with all of these various service providers. So while TriMet's Honored Citizen Program is tremendously helpful as a means of getting subsidized bus passes. It does, once again, presume that the youth have means of getting to and from the TriMet office. They have means of printing out the documentation that they need to fill out and submit, that they already have their birth certificate or their social security card. So there can be a lot of barriers to getting that honored citizen bus pass but we know how crucially important that is to attaining housing and self-sustainability. So we'll assist them with whatever step of the process they're in on that. Um, addiction I skipped over, but that, that's a big one as well. We wanna make sure that we are connecting youth to our alcohol and drug uh, specialist and assessing their stage of change so that we can address whatever addiction barriers exist between them and their housing goals. 
So in conclusion, we're using tools and service models, including assertive engagement, trauma-informed care, and the relational worldview model to build relationships with homeless youth, to provide them with culturally specific services and a connection to their culture and heritage. We use the medicine wheel to develop a four-part individualized goal plan with each client, and then we educate them on and connect them to the resources available to them in the community to overcome whatever barriers exist between them and those goals. We try to maintain meaningful engagement with each client at least two to four times per month to help them restore balance in their lives and progress toward their goals until they age out of the program on their 25th birthday with a greater level of self-sufficiency and a working knowledge of the systems and cultural community that is available to help them on their path. And that concludes my presentation. Any questions? I see some action in the chat. See, we got some fellow, fellow gooey ducks in the chat as well. So shout out to Evergreen. Um, and thank you to those of you who provided links to Nea and Nikwa, where you can learn more about all the services I, I spoke about. Um, I see a comment from Libby who says they would like to see the Nea program replicated in Washington. Um, and yes, I see your contact information, so I'd be happy to reach out to you and discuss some of the supplies that might benefit us both. Hi, C. Mason, I see your comment as well. And no, I don't believe we're in regular contact with that organization. Um, so yes, let's please use this as an opportunity to exchange contact information and get connected because school supplies are something that we hope to connect our clients to. And as I mentioned, a lot of our youth have youth of their own who always need school supplies. Danica, I see your comment as well. I'll be sure to share my contact information with you. And Ticey, thank you for sharing your contact information. I hope I addressed all of your comments and questions. Thank you so much, Riley. You are truly a good relative and do so much for the community um, and just you know, working and seeing um, others in that department, um, you're doing very important work and I know that it can be exhausting, um, but also fulfilling um, on so many different levels. So I'm really appreciative for having you here today and providing resources um, and talking more about what you do day to day. Um, so I appreciate you. Um, and if anyone else has questions for Riley, um, now is a great time before our break, um, but I believe he'll put his contact information in the chat. Thank you again, Riley. Thank Hi, you Katie. for having me. Katie, this is Tanya. I don't have any questions, but I just wanted to share with the folks that this was a very important area that our BHA, our Behavioral Health Aid students identified as something that they wanted to learn more about, you know, especially when they're working with their community members. Uh, so Riley, this information that you provide is so very valuable. Uh, you have such a beautiful wraparound system of, systems of care for your community members. So it's great to see all these tools for success that you provide your, your patients and your um, community members. And I hope that it's okay that if we share your PowerPoint with our participants. Ellen. Yes, absolutely. I have my permission to do that. And uh, thank you so much. I hope that the information I shared resonated with a lot of the students. Wonderful. Thank you, Riley. Um, this is Marilyn Scott from Upper Skagit. Riley, um, I'd like to take this opportunity to just request whether uh, you would be able to add to the resources that you provide to those individuals that are in those homeless and, and have barrier situations, the 
uh, information that we're uh, promoting right now, the behavioral health aid program. Um, you know, some of those individuals that are that you're assisting with barriers now, they're potential individuals that can help us uh, connect up those individuals that have those barriers with the resources that are available out there. So very definitely, if we could share the information and Carrie can, um, and Carrie and Katie can provide the behavioral health aid uh, information to you so that we could share that resource with those individuals that you're assisting. Thank you. Absolutely, I would love to collaborate and get that information shared far and wide. Any other comments uh, or feedback? Questions? Once again, thank you, Riley. Thank you for spending your afternoon with us. You're very welcome. I'll stick around uh, for, for a while in the chat if anyone else has any further comments or questions. So thank you. So on our agenda, we do we did add in a quick break for those who'd like to just step away, do some stretches, grab a coffee or tea, and uh, we'll be back at uh, 240. that there's a theme going on in our presentations around balance um, and specifically intentional balance. And so I want to talk about uh, intentional balance um, in relationship to uh, the, the clients that we serve, the people in the communities that we serve, and how we can do that with them and working across systems. Um, <clears throat> And um, as you know, um, my name is Donica. I'm a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. And um, I'm the Behavioral Health Programs Director at the board, and I'm just really glad to be here. So I do want to just kind of center and define what case management is. Um, <clears throat> you know, case management is an important aspect of what we do in the work that we do as behavioral health um, providers, whether we're chemical dependency providers, we're uh, you know, behavioral health aides or social workers or anything like that. An important part of it is um, managing, um, doing case management and looking at um, all of the needs that our clients need. Um, it also includes providing linkages and training for patients um, and clients served in the use of ba uh, basic community resources and mon monitoring over all service delivery. And if you were in uh, Riley's presentation, a lot of what they were really talking about was like is, was doing that and linking um, houseless kids um, and houseless folks to the resources they need so that they can be stable. Uh, case managers work with people and families experiencing a, a wide variety of social conditions, including houselessness, 
those who are at risk of substance misuse, uh, case managers identify <clears throat> households who are at greater risk and, and also determine the types of support needed to prevent um, any of these issues. Um, they can also help clients develop independent living skills, provide support with treatment and serve as a, co a contact between clients um, and all of the different professionals that are in their lives. You know, to be successful, case managers need the right kinds of skills and adequate community knowledge to be able to do that job. So a lot of what we do as case managers is really connecting with other uh, services and other community uh, resources. Um, and so, you know, the role of a case manager is to undertake um, assessment, monitoring, planning, advocacy, linking of, uh, of clients with uh, different support services. And its function is clearly um, many times around um, relapse prevention and prevention um, in different aspects of people's lives. Um, and so a lot of times though, when we uh, are case managers, we are so overworked and we have so many uh, clients and we have so many cases that we, we really have to struggle and create a balance between what we, are, what we have capacity to do um, and serving the needs of the people that um, need, the, need the support that we have. And so there are some uh, specific principles of case, uh, effective case management. Um, you know, case managers should, should deliver as much help or services as possible um, uh, that they can themselves versus making referrals. And if you do make referrals, um, don't just give out a sheet with a bunch of names and numbers on it. It's really important to do like soft handoffs or introduction of the clients that we're with to um, the services that they need. Um, natural community resources are the primary partners. Um, so like Riley was talking about, with really in like providing uh, basic support needs, housing, <clears throat> hygiene needs, medical needs, and things like this. And the work is in the community. Um, and so the, the stronger our community connections are, the stronger we'll be able to do our work. Um, and really case management should be, um, should be time um, unlimited. It should be based on what the needs of the individual is, not what the needs of the organization are. And, you know, a lot of times, people need services 24 hours a day. Unfortunately, crisis doesn't happen um, between eight to five o'clock. It actually usually happens after those uh, banking hours. And so a lot of times we need to also be flexible or be able to come up with a safety plan for um, the people that we're serving so that they can have um, access to those services when they do go in crisis. Um, and a choice is a really important aspect of case management too, and talking with the, the people that we're serving and offering them a choice of services and helping them prioritize what work needs to happen and what they need. And so uh, what's really important what, when we talk about that balance, you know, what we need to think about is working within multidisciplinary teams. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times we talk about, you know, a lot of organizations have very kind of static concrete boundaries that they have. You know, every organization does what they do and they do their work um, and they're very much siloed. And so an effective case worker or case manager is able to work across boundaries. Um, and, you know, we understand that essential for healthy functioning of individuals and organizations, but, but it can also become problematic when they become limited um, and we're not being able to access the, the needs of the people that we're serving. So boundary spanning often involves risk, um, and, but it also means that we as caseworkers need to, um, you know, 
go the extra mile and reach out and build relationships. And then it also comes back to relationships. When I was uh, doing case management and clinical uh, treatment with clients, um, many, many times I was able to access services for my clients um, because I had a relationship with someone at the organization that I needed to make a referral for. for. So if I just gave them a phone number, <clears throat> said, you need to call XYZ organization and make an appointment for an assessment or an intake, they would never get in, even if they would call, they would get put on a waiting list, there would you know, be whatever happened, if they even called at all. But if I sat down and called someone from XYZ organization and said, hey, Tanya, I have this uh, client that really needs some support right now. Is there any way that I can get you to book an, a, an intake for this client? I have them sitting right here. Can we set up a time? Then we would be able to get those appointments scheduled. And so part of it is just kind of going above and beyond in those ways. But again, it's also about relationships. It's about our relationships with our clients, but it's also about relationships um, across organizations and that boundary spanning. And so, you know, when we think about it, you know, we think about these as threads and the more threads you have and the, the tighter weave you have, the stronger the fabric. And so, you know, when we think about there's this interface between, um, you know, primary care, public and community health, behavioral health, it's particularly important to keep individuals and communities healthy. Primary care tends to focus on the disease, treatment and health promotion needs of an individual with a limited view of all community members. But a healthy community is what makes healthy individuals. And so we wanna build those community relationships and build those stronger threads for our fabric. And so we all have the skills for this. Um, you know, an, an important part of uh, case management skills, important skills for behavioral health aids is strong communication skills. Um, all of these different organizations have a different language that they speak. And so it's important for us to be able to kind of translate the different communications of these different organizations. Time management is always an important part of what happens, especially when we have uh, 20 to 40 or 50 clients or even more. Um, and being creative in the way that we problem solve. And sometimes the best problem solving happens um, when we do that with the client. Um, and then listening to clients where they're at and not listening to respond to, but listen to hear about their experiences and utilizing critical thinking skills to think about like what, uh, you know, alternative problems. And then collaboration. And another part of this is really uh, being a leader and supporting and advocating for our clients across these different systems. And I'll share a story. Um, one time I had in Denver, a, 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 he was an undocumented um, youth. He was 15 years old. His family was from Mexico. Um, they didn't speak English. He um, was bilingual, but his first language was Spanish. And when I got him, I got him as, uh, as a treatment. He was referred for mental health and drug and alcohol treatment. And I was trying to work with him just to schedule a time to get him in for his intake. And we just couldn't figure out a time because every time I said, you know, let's meet at this day and time, he had another appointment. So we finally just, I said, oh, let's just sit, sit down and list all of your professionals and what the expectations are for your meeting with them. And this kid had 15 different professionals and different expectations for him. So was a 15 year old boy um, and who didn't speak English very well and his parents certainly couldn't advocate for him. And 
And, um, you know, so my recommendation to his case manager was that they uh, get back together and prioritize for him what his treatment needed to look like, because at this point, he was not going to be successful. And for him, uh, being unsuccessful meant that he was going to be committed to the Department of Youth Corrections. Um, and that was my clinical um, you know, uh, advice to his case management team was to get together and with the family and prioritize what they needed to do. This didn't happen. Um, and unfortunately, he was committed to the Department of Youth Corrections, not because he was uh, a safety risk to the community or to himself, but because he could not meet the unrealistic expectations of all the case managers in his life. And that is the reality of it, is that that's the consequences of it. So when we are working with people, it's really important to prioritize um, and act um, and advocate for our clients so that we can help. Um, and, and I wish in hindsight that I had taken a stronger stance in asking for uh, those professionals to stand up for him. Um, but what it all comes down to is that it comes down to relationships. Um, to thrive, human beings, we need each other. And the stronger our relationships, the stronger our communities. Um, and in my professional life, I've been able to support many people um, in the work that we're doing through the relationships that I have with other providers. Um, and that's something that I'm very proud of. One of the the first professional advice I ever got when I was in my undergraduate um, program was that my uh, mentor told me, go to every meeting you can go to, go to every conference that you can go to, and, and meet as many people as you can. If you go to a conference, get 10 business cards, and then follow up with those folks when you get back to your office or when you get home and say, hey, my name is Donica. I met you at this conference. I really like to connect with you. This is the work that I'm doing in the organization. Um, and you know, build those relationships, network, network, network. My job was easier because I had relationships, not only with my clients and their families, but I had relationships with other people in the community and um, with other organizations. Um, and when, when it comes down to it, um, a lot of it is like coming back to this idea of self-care versus community care. You know, community care is about the individual caring of our own basic physical needs, whereas community care is focused on the collective, taking care of people together for everything from basic physical to psychological and even spiritual needs. Community care involves more than one person. It can include two people, three people, or even hundreds of people. And we can practice community care in our own uh, personal lives by connecting with each other. And that's one of the things that I really love about this elders and knowledge keepers gathering is that we're building community together, even through this pandemic and this virtual world. Um, and that we're supporting each other and we're taking care of each other um, through these, through all of the struggles that we're having. And so um, one of, but it's important, it is important to take care of yourself, but we do that collectively. And again, it is about relationships. Um, community care is about relationships. It's about taking care of yourself as a provider, as well as taking care of the people that we serve and our community collectively. And I, that's the end of my presentation, but I wanted to open it up for any kind of conversation um, or questions. Is there anything, is there some chat in the, it is. Are there any thoughts or questions or comments? Good.
then I will give up my time to Tanya and the next presenter. So Donica, Lama Yum, thank you for your presentation and your beautiful PowerPoint. I hope that it's okay that we share with our participants. Great, thank you. And then also too, for those that weren't uh, able to attend uh, our session earlier today, just wanted to let folks know that our behavioral health aid students um, were our driving force in creating our agenda with you uh, for today and uh, tomorrow. And uh, our students identified case management as an important tool that they wanted to see in our discussions today, you know, to help them uh, move forward in their education process and working with their clients and with their community members. So I know this is going to be a very helpful tool as we share this with our students and with our community members that have joined us today. So thank you for that, Donica. Thank you for always spending your, your precious time with us. I know that you're extremely busy, so I always appreciate listening to your to your presentations and your land acknowledgements. Those are always really good words. So thank you for that. Anytime. And so Katie, I'm gonna give the floor to you. And I do know that our next presenter has logged on. So thank you. I am going to transition us once again. Thank you so much, Donica. Um, Jenny has been a community health worker for Native American Youth and Family Center for five years, working to address health disparities within the Portland Native community through opportunities for connection to, tradi to traditional medicines and foods health education and systems navigation and advocacy. She is also a natural helper with the Future Generations Collaborative, a group centering traditional native values and collaboration in the prevention of FASD using multi-generational education, engagement and policy. I was lucky enough to work side by side with Jenny um, during um, summer youth camp where we were able to build curriculum culturally specific for native kiddos um, and share a space of storytelling, wellness activities. Um, she's just an overall awesome human being and I'm so honored to have her as a friend. So I am going to pass the floor along to Jenny for her presentation. Hello to, hi everyone, it's nice to see you. Danica, is it your birthday? Happy birthday! Um, I apologize, I'm coming in hot from picking my daughter up from school. <laughs> I tried to get to the school pickup line uh, early, <laughs> but I'm like practicing my deep breathing. Um, uh, as Katie said, my name is Jenny. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. I'm Oklahoma Choctaw, and I'm a community health work program coordinator at the Native American Youth and Family Center. Um, or NEA. Um, and I was going to talk with you all about um, cottonwood today. And the reason I, I chose um, cottonwood, because it's not season to, to pick cottonwood buds, um, was because I had a jar of cottonwood oil <laughs> that I was going to share with you all. Um, but I, I, I had a mishap in trying to figure out how to mail the containers and they leaked. <laughs> So they weren't, so I guess it's not going to be a hands-on activity, but we're still going to talk about it. And then I have things set up to do a little demo um, if there's time. But I think it's it's still, my my thought was, um, like Katie said, uh, at NEA, we, we work a lot with youth and families and um, we do uh, summer and spring break camps and um, culture nights and, and different activities. And uh, Cottonwood, I think it's a really good, um, it's a really good lesson in a lot of things. Um, and one of those being uh, about just taking um, what we need and that nature like gives us, nature like gives us what we need in abundance, right? And um, 
Let me share my screen so you can look at the pictures of the cottonwood. Oh yeah, we have a recipe too. So you can look at the pictures of the cottonwood and not my face. Because <laughs> the cottonwood is prettier. Um, oops. Okay, I think I got it here. Can y'all see that? Okay. Oh, oh no, I hope you can't see that. I just made a mistake. <laughs> Present, there we go. Okay. All right. Um, so so the, the cottonwood that we have, uh, everyone on here is from, or is in the Pacific Northwest, right? Y'all are located somewhere, somewhere throughout the Pacific Northwest. Um, the type of cottonwood that we have here is, um, is black cottonwood, and it has lots of different names. And I've been trying to be uh, better about, um, about learning those names, like the scientific names or their government name or whatever you want to call it, um, because a lot of different, throughout a, like a, di a lot of different territories, people have different names, right? And some of the names might be the same for different plants. Um, but these are just a few of them, and you'll hear it. Um, you'll hear it called um, balls, balls and popular uh, a lot. Is I don't know where that comes from. <laughs> Somewhere in Europe, I think. Um, but the the scientific name that that populus uh, it means the people's tree, which is that's that's pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, okay, this is really cool. So if you if you um if you take the branch, if you take the branch of a cottonwood, uh, like a twig, and you snap it in half just right or or cut it, um, you'll see that there's a tiny little star inside of it, um, and and you gotta you gotta do it just right to see it, but it's really cool. And there's all sorts of there's all sorts of stories about the cottonwood tree. Um, uh, do do any of you have any stories? that are on here. I like to put people on the spot. <laughs> this is Frank. <gasps> Frank. How are you? Good. N better now that I hear your voice. OK. Uh, when I was a kid, we used to smoke a lot of salmon. We used to cottonwood. And I don't know if it's the same kind of cottonwood that we have in Alaska, you know, but it's smoldered real good. Um, and so and so we used to go out and cut a lot of cottonwood because we used to smoke a lot of fish. And uh, I'm I'm thinking cottonwood is cottonwood. If there's if there's various types, I don't know, but that's what we use cottonwood for, and a lot of it because it smoldered so good. That's awesome, Frank. Thank you for sharing that. I think I think it is. I'm not 100% certain, but I think it is um, the same. Uh, black cottonwood up there in Alaska. Does anyone else have a, have a cottonwood story they wanna share? I'll do the awkward pause, okay. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of different stories. There's, um, there's one story, um, there's, it's, a, it's a Dakota story and um, it's uh, uh, from Mary Louise, uh, I'm going to forget her name. Her, say her up. Mary Louise Protector Wilson, I think is her name. Um, and she tells the story um, of Cottonwood that there was, there was this, I'll just like abbreviate it for time's sake, but there's, there's this little star back when everything was new. There was like this little tiny star just, just cruising around, doing what stars do, twinkling brightly. Um, and it heard this beautiful noise. And uh, um, so I got closer and, it, and the noise that it heard was people. And so it listened for a while and it went back to the stars and then it got like sad and was, was telling the other stars, man, I really like to go back down there and hear that noise. It was so beautiful. I can't get it out of my head. And then the, the elder stars were like, you can't do that because those people have like so much work to do. They have to take care of their kids. They got to like, they have to like gather food. They have to make their clothes and you're just going to distract them. And so eventually um, the little star just couldn't think, 
couldn't stop thinking about that noise. And so the stars, the other stars said, okay, if you can like, you can, you can go down there and you can find a place to be that's not going to bother them, then you can go. And so um, the little star went down and found a cottonwood tree and hid inside the branches of the cottonwood tree so, so that they could listen to the people. And the sound that, that the star was hearing was the people um, uh, laughing, was them sharing food together, and was, was of them like saying kind things to each other. And so that's why you can break the branch and you can find the, find the cottonwood tree. The star inside the cottonwood tree and that's um i don't tell that story to my daughter but i tell her that um when there's a bad, a bad windstorm I, I always tell her i'm like that's um that's that's you know greater like giving us more stars like those trees those branches are going to fall and um more of those stars are going to be are going to be released and then she tells me to be quiet no <laughs> just kidding okay so um oh and all the pictures in here um I think the picture on the other one was uh, was my child, but um, these are all community health workers um, from the Portland community uh, because they're awesome. And I put their pictures in here. So so cottonwood loves to grow. Um, it loves water. So you'll find cottonwood around um, around streams, um, places where there's a lot of water. Um, and oh yeah, I did put it on here up up southern Alaska. Um, uh, you'll find the uh, uh, the black cottonwoods, um, and it likes to hang out around um, uh, alder trees and willow trees. Um, so that's a good place to find it, and a good way to tell that which one is cottonwood is because it'll usually be taller than um, than the other trees around it. It grows high and fast. Oop. All right. Um, yeah. So it grows fast and tall, um, and the the bark will be uh, furrowed and gray. Um, and right now, if you go out and try to find cottonwood, you know, cottonwood is famous because of the, the snow, that like snow in the summertime, you know, um, that you see flying everywhere, the seeds. If you, um, if you go out and look for cottonwood right now, I think the leaves are just starting to change color. And um, they have a good way that I, to identify it that I use is like looking under the leaf and it'll be like kind of white on the bottom. So it'll be like lighter on the bottom. Um, but once you find the telltale way <laughs> to find a cottonwood, to know that you have cottonwood is to smell the bud. Like, and once you know that smell, you'll never forget it. And also the resin, when you touch the resin, it's like, it's red and it's, um, it's kind of sticky and it's hard to get off your skin. So like once you, once you learn how to identify it, you'll uh, be a pro for life. Here's another one of our community health workers. Um, this picture was taken during COVID, obviously. <laughs> um, so uh, usually late January is when the buds are ready. It's, it's hard to say now because of, uh, you know, with like climate change and all the like weather that's been happening exactly when, um, when they'll be ready. But usually, usually late January um, is, is when the buds are ready. Um, the bark, I don't, I don't usually, um, I, I usually just work with the buds and I don't collect the leaves and the bark too much, but um, throughout fall is usually when people um, harvest bark. They say like, what do they say when, this, when the sap is running is the time um, for that? And then some more of our community health workers. Um, yeah, so you a trick that you can do um, when you're when you're gathering the buds is put like salve on your fingers or like oil if you're worried about them uh, being stained. And here in a second, well, I'm going to move over to the other side of my kitchen, uh, and I'll show you the jar. Like once you have a cottonwood jar, that's your cottonwood jar. Oh, actually, it's right here. So you're never going to use this for anything else <laughs> because it's never going to come clean. <laughs> uh, and you can see the like that resin on there, that dark, beautiful resin the medicine in there. Um, so I think I saw someone, I can't see everybody now because I'm sharing screen, um, but I thought I, I seen someone in here who might might have been in this story that I'm going to tell you all. Um, during this winter, um, it was right after we had that like bad windstorm. We had that bad windstorm and then we had a, a culture night happening like on that Wednesday and nobody wanted to drive and do like deliveries for supplies because we're doing things virtually. And uh, so so they were like, 
um, so I was like, I'll just talk about, I'll just talk about Cottonwood. <laughs> and uh, so I just like talked to everyone about Cottonwood. And then we decided um, on the weekend, a very small group of people could go out and, uh, and, um, and gather some Cottonwood. And uh, so we were able to find a, like a good place and, and we met up and there were so many branches on the ground, like the, like the, um, like, like creator had just like, like given us so much that there was no need to have to um, like take from the tree. And that's something that um, there's, I bet you that there's, there's people on this call. There's like, there's controversy, whether you should um, take from the tree. Uh, but this was just like, this was a time there was no need at all. So it was, it was really just an awesome um, lesson in like, in, in like, you know, like the earth gives us what we need. Um, but anyways, we like, we were able to get so much cottonwood that um, like we had enough oil um, that it lasted us up until like, I still have some left and we we've been using it for our vaccination events to gift people. So we've been giving them um, like little vials of cottonwood oil to put on their sore muscles. Uh, uh, oh, cat can, don't let me, stop me, stop me if I start just going on and on and you need to reel me in, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> um so these are the catkins um and these will come out like once these catkins come out it's too late you don't want to like collect them for um for like for oil uh but you can eat them and they're really high in vitamin c and then um here's the fun part uh i think those are my daughter's fingers so so cottonwood oil um and and in the bark also um has a uh, salicylin in it which is um where what aspirin is derived from. So it's used to relieve pain and inflammation. Um, people usually also use it on the skin. Um, it has like anti, um, antioxidants and, and a lot of healing properties. I've heard that people use it for like wrinkles too, but I haven't tried it. Maybe I, maybe I need to check that out. <laughs> um, and then here's our little um, recipe. I put, uh, I'm gonna like walk while I'm talking so I can get back over to this stuff. Um, but um, I, so like the ratio to beeswax on here, I put, I, I put one to eight because I made this in a different season that I made your flyer, but um, it's kind of like, you know, it's like cooking. It doesn't have to be, you know, the perfect amount, but there's like, yeah, the pictures and everything. Um, so you can see, oh, I should have found a more flattering picture of myself for this one. <laughs> but these, um, these double broilers, you can get these um, very, very cheap, like on Amazon for like eight bucks or something. And I really like to use them. People have like fancy pots and stuff um, that are awesome and cool, but don't let like not having fancy things pre prevent you from, from making medicine um, is what I always think about. And then um, this, I'll just kind of walk through it quickly. Um, I don't have any more cottonwood oil uh, infusing, but this is, um, this is actually devil's club that someone gave me. Um, but so, so with, with cottonwood buds, um, you can dry them out a little bit, but they don't hold a lot of water. Um, and then fill your jar, you know, like about that full with the buds, not packed down. You don't want them packed down. And then, uh, you just get out your olive oil. Uh, I was like, this is kind of fancy olive oil that I just found, but like whatever you can, like whatever you can afford is, is, uh, is what you got. <laughs> and that's okay. Um, and some people are like, what cut or oil, uh, vent, you know, uh, olive oil. Like I eat that. I don't want to put that on my skin, but it's actually really good. And I've messed around with like lots of different types of oils and, uh, olive oil just has like a really long shelf life. So, you, um, cause the worst thing is to like, you make your medicine and like, you've like, put so much care into gathering it and like and preparing it and then it molds <laughs> and then and you have to throw it out like there's once it's moldy um you can't you can't use it you can't give it to people uh but anyway so I fill it about that full with uh with the plant material with uh with cottonwood buds and then the rest of the way with olive oil and the most important thing make sure that they're pull it up as high as you can and that it's completely covering and if it floats you just flip it up um, some people put a cloth here because they don't want the metal to, um, they don't want it to like erode the metal. Uh, I did not do that, but, but some people do. Um, and then just like, you can either set it somewhere and, uh, just set it somewhere where you can see it. And every day just give it a good shake. 
um, and for about three weeks, and uh, and then you're ready to strain it out. Um, or you can you can speed things up and use a uh, use a crock pot. Um, like you can see in this picture, it looks funny. I put um, I added coconut oil to it, uh, so uh, that's why it, that's that white stuff in there. But um, you can put it in a crock pot and then put it with the lid off on the lowest setting. And um, when it gets like when it starts feeling super hot, turn it off for a little bit, turn it back on. I like turn it off when I go to sleep, uh, turn it back on in the morning, and do that for about three days. And uh, and and you can do it that way. I like to do it um, the slow way, like if I'm not in a hurry, because I feel like I don't know. You kind of like you. I don't know. I feel like that's part of the medicine is like taking care of it, right? And like um, you're putting all your love into it, like every single day, and your intentions into it. You know. Um, Okay, I can't remember what's on the next slide. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, real quickly I'll say this and then I'll show you all this stuff. Uh, um, so, oh, that's my dog. <laughs> that's Hazel, my puppy, being held by my child. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the cool things about um, cottonwood, so, for your for like respiratory first before I say any of this like um you should always like consult with your with your health provider before making any um like putting anything into your body or making like any um yeah like I'm not a doctor is my point <laughs> so um like I, you know I always encourage people to be an advocate for your own health and if you know especially if you're on medications or things like that um to do your research and uh but that being said um one of the cool uses of um of cottonwood oil uh, or cottonwood buds. This is, uh, this is, I already strained the buds out of this a while ago, but this is honey that I infused the cottonwood buds on. And um, you can, so, so it has this um, expectorant properties that help pull, uh, pull mucus out of your lungs is what people use it for. Um, and uh, it's, it's not really, the cottonwood bud oil isn't really water soluble. So, so like drinking it in a tea, <clears throat> would be challenging uh but so anyways I did it about the same as the oil I I, I did it for about three weeks and then I, I took the plant material out which is important because once again you don't want it to mold um but yeah and then you can just you can take a little bit when you have um when you're having like respiratory stuff coming on uh oh yeah I don't put it in my nose I put that on the slide but <laughs> Okay. Oh yeah. This is my disclaimer. Here's my, <laughs> and it's, it's a disclaimer and it's a meme, uh, popular because people, you know, call it awesome popular. <laughs> okay. And then I think this is heated up so I can show you guys. I'll just stop. Uh, wait, stop share. There we are. Okay. So if y'all can see. Are we doing okay on time? Okay. <clears throat> also, I tried to clean my house behind me and then when my kid came in, like threw their backpack and shoes everywhere, <laughs> so. Okay. I'm gonna scoot y'all forward. You can see. There's a light here. Can y'all see that okay? Okay. So, um, if you have a, a fine mesh strainer, that's actually like way easier to um, to do it to to strain out your plant material. And I don't know where mine is at, so I'm using this cheesecloth, which the cheesecloth is great too, and it works good for um, when you're straining out like other plant material that's. Um, like smaller. Okay. See if I can do this without losing my cheesecloth. And then uh, that's why it's good if you have things that are like real absorbent. Oh, okay. Um, and then give it a, it's messy work. So you just gotta be 
You gotta be okay with that. Oh, it smells really good. Okay. And then, uh, oh. um, and then you just moisturize your skin. Maybe get your ends there <laughs> for your split ends. Um, so, okay, it's math time. <laughs> it's math time, everyone. So I have a half a cup of oil here. And I wanna do, let's do a one to four ratio because um, that'll be easier math. So if I have a half a cup, how much beeswax do I need? Who's the math person here? <laughs> I wouldn't say nothing. Is it one third? <laughs> what? One third? I don't know. Let's we'll see. <laughs> Would it be one eighth? We're just like, like we're making spaghetti. I can't find the right cup. Oh, one eighth. Okay. <laughs> I got. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded right. I don't know. <laughs> all right. It's a little heavy. Oh, I wanted to show you all this too. Okay. The beeswax. So um, you can see like they have bars of beeswax that are really cool. Uh, oh, Danica, are you going to say something? Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, they have like bars of beeswax where you can shave the beeswax off. Uh, but I'm like uh, kind of lazy. So I like to use these beeswax uh, uh, past pastels. I don't know how you say it, but they're like little tiny dots. And so they melt faster. Um, and you'll see this is yellow, but you'll also see them white. And I guess that has to do with how many times they're filtered in that like process. But I think they're just the same. The only thing is like, this will turn your, um, your end product will be, will have that yellow color to it. So, okay. Dang, I wish I could, I need a headlamp here. <laughs> okay, so I filled this pot. I filled this pot so it's the water level is right underneath the, um, the double broiler and it's boiling. And uh, I don't want to turn the fan on cause that's all you'll hear, but it's like steaming me up. <laughs> steaming me up over here. Um, and then have your jars, your jars like ready to go. Cause as soon as it's melted, you need to pour it. Um, sweat lodge. Yeah. It's just about the second round here. <laughs> uh, and also if you, um, like, I don't know if any of y'all, um, like make stuff, but you can like get real into it and you can start making your own body butters. Um, I was like really into that before, um, before COVID and I kind of got distracted and haven't made body butter in a while, but you can start adding fun things like, um, uh, oh, like cocoa butter, um, shea butter and things like that. But, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna do that right now because our ratios will be all off. <laughs> Okay, so our jars are ready. Oh, these are just a couple different kinds of jars. Um, I really like these glass ones. They're not good for kids, obviously, but those are cool. These are better for people who break things, these little tins, and they're cheaper too. Um, and I like to use small containers. Like I would rather have like multiple small containers, not just so I can like give, I can gift them, uh, but also because, uh, I don't need some big container rolling around in my car, like melting, <laughs> you know, making a mess. <laughs> All right. Dang, I wish I could figure out how to show you this because it looks cool when you pour the, uh, the oil in. Let's see if I can do it. I'm going to mess this up. All right. Okay. Can you see it? I'm trying to be steady so I don't make anyone sick. <laughs> Okay, it's, it's just about melted. Come on. So when it's, I'm gonna just speed it up. When it's completely melted. Pour in your oil. 
And it looks like egg flour soup. Which I always, I don't know. That makes me happy for some reason. <laughs> okay. Jenna, you're doing great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. I also, uh, I haven't done any like virtual workshops all summer. We've been doing like, you know, summer camp and, and things. And so this is my first one of the, of the season. <laughs> so thanks for, for bearing with me. Okay. And then uh, I don't have any clean spoons, so I'm using a fork. <laughs> Give us a little stir. Uh, if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to add essential oils, um, in here, uh, you, I do it. If I do use essential oils, I, as soon as I remove it off the heat, then I do. Um, so I don't like steam them back out, but I don't use a lot of essential oils, um, because they're really strong concentrations of plant medicine. Um, and they take a lot of plant material to make like for like roses. It's like, it's something wild, like 10,000 10, pounds of rose petals to make like, uh, like an ounce of, don't quote me on this, <laughs> uh, to make an ounce of, uh, rose essential oil, which is like, smells amazing. And you know, if someone gave me one, I'd be really happy, but, um, and you lose that relationship, right? Of like infusing the oil yourself. And like I said, that's, I think that's a big part of the, the medicine there. Um, but I'm not like hating on essential oils, if anyone, <laughs> that's your thing. Okay. Oh. And then also I have this, I didn't use it, but uh, like I have this little digital scale. You can use that too to do your little ratio. Um, I don't think it works. <laughs> I have it sitting here, but I don't think it's like, it's accurate. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna. Move that back. Um, I am gonna, I'm not gonna use essential oil, but I'm gonna use a few drops of, uh, oh, uh, vitamin E oil. Uh, oh, I just saw, I, I haven't seen most of the, uh, the chat, but I seen that one. Yeah. Isn't that out of this world? <laughs> um, okay. So vitamin E oil, um, what I'm going to say this is right now is it's controversial, but I stand by it. <laughs> um, I, I use vitamin E oil, um, to help preserve, um, the salve. Um, and then it's also good for your skin. There's like a lot of people that don't, uh, there's, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of discussion <laughs> in the plant medicine community regarding that, but I use it. Um, and I just use a little bit and I do it when it comes off the, off the heat. Another quick talking and do it fast before this like solidifies again. Okay. I'm trying to make sure this ain't hot. Do this. Okay, hopefully this is enough containers. Everyone say a prayer. <laughs> Someone got a chunk of beeswax in it. Almost. Almost. Oh, I forgot to show you all tricks. All right. Did you, uh, you want to see how, like what the consistency is? If how you're, you know, how thick your beeswax is. Um, dang, if this was a spoon, this would work way better. But <laughs> just like take a drop and um, drop it on the stove or the counter uh, and then let it dry for a second. And then you'll get an idea of, of, uh, of how thick it is. And you can do it however you want. Some people might, you might like your staff. So it like, is super easy to get on. Like when we were doing the, for the flu shots, you know, like that muscle pain, people don't like, uh, you know, like when I got my COVID vaccine, I didn't really want to be like, really rubbing. <laughs> I just wanted some gentle love. Um, and so, you know, we use things that were more, um, yeah, not so hard, but if I'm like making, you know, dabs with kids or like lip balms or something, and I know they're going to be like in their, you know, the back of their mom's car <laughs> on the floor, <laughs> make it a little, um, make it thicker. Okay. So, and then I just leave the lid off and let it dry and then uh, be sure to, to label it. Um, and uh, if it, can I take a couple, couple more minutes? This is like two more minutes. Okay. 
um i was just going to show you i didn't put it in my slideshow like my um like uh what would you say references uh <laughs> of information but i was just going to show you all some good books that are good resources um for for plants here in the pacific northwest um and uh like you take in, you take like what you need from each book, right? Like I'm not saying like, I'm not sticking up for these authors or anything, or like, I don't know them personally, but um, this is a good one. Uh, the uh, Pacific Northwest Medicinal Plants has a lot of good information. And then, uh, and I use like different, I use a few books because some, some will have different information or like, we'll talk about different things, you know, than the other. And uh, just like anything, like you, like taking as much information as you can and then, and then do what you want. No, <laughs> um, this is another good one. Uh, Medicinal plants of the Pacific Northwest. They're like, it's, their titles are practically the same. Um, and then here's another good one. Um, and this isn't, this doesn't talk about uh, medicinal values really of the plants, but it has like a lot of good identification. And then um, one other thing I want to share that is like super awesome and, uh, this curriculum that we've been trying to um, integrate into the things that we're doing um, at NEA that came from the, um, uh, it came from, I gotta look at the title. <laughs> um, uh, oh, Grub. Have you all heard of Grub? Garden Week up in Olympia? Oh, the third one was the, this one. Um, Grub is an awesome organization up in Olympia and uh, the Northwest Indian Treatment Center. They made this curriculum called Plant Teachings for Growing Social Emotional Skills. Uh, yes, yes, Elise Crone. Like, yeah, yeah, she's awesome. Um, but they made this, um, and you can look, you can look it up pretty easy and find these, but they have like cool cards too. Um, and uh, like, I was gonna say it at the beginning, like my inner when I introduced myself, but I was all nervous. <laughs> Oh, someone's got it. Layla's got it. It's good, huh? Have you been using it? Yeah. Yes, we use it a lot here at the Seattle Indian Health Board. Oh, awesome. You are one of our funders. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's it's amazing. Um, and uh, so so part of like the reason that I am like like so passionate about um about plant medicine and like always learning and um, like, and just love to share whenever I get the chance is because um, like learning from plants has been a big, huge part of my own like healing journey as a human being. And um, uh, like, I just, I, there's always, uh, oh yeah. Uh, it, I'll put the books in there in the chat here in a second. I'm almost done and I'll, I'll stick them all in there. That'll be easier than just me waving in front of the screen. <laughs> Um, but, uh, anyway, so that's like, like, I'm always, you know, like, what does this plant have to teach me? Like how to be a good person, um, and just like how to be in the world and, um, you know, that they just sit there and like, like can just be and be okay. Uh, and like have something to contribute, you know? And, uh, yeah. Anyway, so this book is, uh, is, uh, like hits on that exactly. And, uh, the cottonwood. They have a thing in here about cottonwood and they talk about it being a wellspring and how um i think they do yeah i think even elise you can like email elise at grub um to order stuff they're yeah they're super awesome they're, they're real cool people up there um but anyway so um so cottonwood they they talk about it being a, a wellspring and how um like cottonwood can just with its big leaves and branches can pull pull the moisture like out of the atmosphere and like like basically make it rain right like like can it, it just has these deep roots and uh so i'm like jenny how can you make it rain no <laughs> no i'm just kidding no but <laughs> uh uh but seriously <laughs> um but, but that you know like when i'm going through a hard time like think about how like what do i have you know within myself within my like support circle like within my like you know, DNA that can help, help get me through this. Um, and like, we all have that, you know, that power to, to draw in. So, yeah. Uh, did I forget anything? Am I done? <laughs> that was awesome, Jenny. I learned so much. I had no idea that there were stars in cottonwood branches. 
Yeah. Thank you. I'll just uh, I'll um mute myself and put the books in the chat. Does anyone has any questions? I don't have any questions, but thank you, Jenny. Your presentation was so energetic and very interactive. Um, so yeah, for those that uh, pre-registered, you'll also get an apron. So when you're using, when you're making your salve, you'll have your apron that you can, you can use. So thank you. You need it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to stain clothing. <laughs> oh, I loved it. I was giggling in such a good way during your presentation. Yeah, you definitely uplifted our afternoon with your laughter. Thank you, and, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I don't know a person at the Northwest Portland Area and Indian Health Board that isn't amazing and awesome. Uh, so I, I feel really honored to be here. And um, for all of you on the call, all you um, folks either in the behavioral health program or like looking to, um, to join that program, uh, I just have so much respect and admiration for all of you. and. Uh, and and like you know making that commitment and um you know giving up your time and energy to like care for our uh care for our relatives y'all are awesome thank you jenny that was wonderful just wanted to let folks know that we are actually on point with our agenda this afternoon Really good to see that. Wow. Um, in previous uh, draft agendas, we had shared that we were going to host a yoga session at four, but unfortunately, that's not going to happen today. So um, we'll leave it open uh, if folks want to stay on. But we also wanted to uh, wrap up and uh, if there are any closing announcements that folks want to share or um, your uh, feedback or your comments on what you experienced this afternoon would be really appreciated. So I'll leave it open for anyone who wants to share. This is Katie. I just wanted to share my screen with you all quickly. Um, in your goodie box, um, if you registered for that, you'd be getting a raffle number. Um, and that is because I um, beaded a raffle prize for you all, all the participants. I'm going to share my screen to show you what that raffle is. Can you see my screen okay? So um, I beaded this. I have a small business for beading called Studio Euphorbia. Um, I called it the Mother Earth's Colors. Um, it says lanyard, but it's not that long. It's a keychain more so. Um, <laughs> it's got a couple of little turquoise. Um, and so this will be the raffle prize. Um, we had raffle tickets in everybody's box. Um, we're gonna hold this raffle tomorrow at the end of the conference. Uh, you do have to be on to receive the prize, um, but just because, um, not everybody will be receiving their box in time. I'm going to put everybody's name on a wheel spinner. And at the end of the event tomorrow, we'll do a wheel spin and see who the lucky winner is for the raffle. Um, so I just wanted to show you to get you excited about that. I will stop sharing. Um, and I also just wanted to make an announcement that um, this gathering is to um, work with BHA students, but to also recruit mentors. Um, I'll be giving a presentation tomorrow about recruitment for the Behavioral Health Aid Education Program. Um, but we are looking to recruit um, students to attend Heritage University and Northwest Indian College. Um, and we really want to set them up for success financially, emotionally, making sure that they have enough support as possible. Um, and that entails them um, finding a mentor, an elder, a knowledge holder, or a culture keeper. If you are someone in the community who is willing to work with these um, new BHAs starting in January of 2022, if you know anyone who is kind of willing to reconnect uh, with the community, um, to share their knowledge with these BHAs, to provide that support, 
um, tell stories, um, be a good auntie or uncle, um, anything along those lines. Um, we are uh, also recruiting mentors. So I'm putting uh, the link, a link in the chat, um, which you can share and we will also disperse this, um, but it's a mentor interest form. So if you want to nominate somebody or if you yourself are interested, um, we're looking for a handful and we'll also be continuing these gatherings and um, in a Zoom session so that uh, mentors and elders also have the support they need to um, build a community of support while they're supporting. Um, but that is all of my announcements and I just really appreciate everyone coming to hold this space and I learned so much and I'm so honored to share this space with you all. And I look forward to um, talking with you a little bit more about myself and the education program tomorrow. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. <clears throat> Do we have Donica or uh, Carrie still on the um, on our link? I'm not seeing them, but. So for those that uh, were able to participate today, today we got to witness the relational worldview, a framework and process for assessments on an individual and community level. Uh, working with our house as community members, a community outreach resource and tools that we'll be able to provide everyone today. Case management, identifying existing resources, networking and methods of prioritizing and we also had our wellness activity with Jenny. So thank you for very much for our presenters today. And uh, as Katie has shared, we will be providing a, uh, a raffle. So a really great um, incentive for those who uh, wish to uh, continue on tomorrow afternoon. And speaking of tomorrow, Katie will be sharing a, uh, the latest recruitment and education program update for the Northwest. We'll also be uh, hosting a presentation remembering our two spirit relatives. Uh, very valuable um, resources that uh, Itai will be providing us tomorrow afternoon, along with a storytelling session, leadership within the tribal community as they provide their lived experience, along with passing on the knowledge of uh, what they've um, gathered throughout the years. And we'll also be providing our latest program updates as we wrap up tomorrow afternoon. So we have still a lot of people still on the line. If there's anything that anyone has any questions about, comments, feedback, you can also use the chat, the chat box too. Yeah, this is Frank Elby in Portland. I'm a elder from Alaska, part of the native community here in Portland. And I pulled your uh, agenda a little while back and at first i was i was on the impression it would be a gathering of northwest elders and i wonder how many elders there are here that are you know signed in today um my impression mostly what we're talking about you know we're talking about oh caseworkers and counseling and mental health and coordinators and community outreach and things like this I was wondering how much, uh, as far as elders and what they do, you know, was uh, uh, was was going was was going to come up. Um, I've enjoyed everything I've heard today. I've been this. I was a little bit late, but uh, I've enjoyed the meeting. And while I'm here, I want to thank Jenny for. Um, the so tomatoes and uh, garlic chives and jalapenos and other stuff that I got from her earlier this spring. I, I did my harvesting yesterday. The only thing less I got to harvest this is the is chives. So, but I enjoyed everything that was kind of being said today, but I was just wondering how much of this is really pertains to or about elders gathering of Northwest elders. 
And so a, a little brief history about that is um, we adopted uh, bringing our elders, our community holders, culture keepers into the education program for our behavioral health aid students based off of the, the successful um, outcomes that uh, our partners from Alaska have created, uh, um, I wanna say, was it in 2016, 2018, Katie, that ANTHC created their BHA program? Yeah. And so uh, what they did uh, was they also embraced the knowledge of our elders into their education program to help with their students uh, creating those, um, you know, those recipes of success, lessons learned, um, helping them through their education program, along with helping them as they're providing services for the community members. And as we adopted that principle, those, that guiding force within the Pacific Northwest, uh, some of our students were, um, were wondering you know, when they're identifying a mentor to go with them hand in hand in their education program, did they necessarily need to be an elder? Um, some folks self-identified as an elder. Some folks were uh, appointed by the community as elders, but then we also didn't want to just narrow it down to just an elder, but also to those that are curators of their culture within their community, uh, those that carry stories, those that carry knowledge. And so we kind of, we embraced every, uh, you know, title, if you want to, you know, say it that way, but we didn't want to just keep it just as an elder, because an elder can also be someone, you know, of, of a younger age. And so we didn't want to just pinpoint it just to an elder, but just to embrace all curators that truly have an appreciation for their craft, who are willing to share their knowledge and their experience with our students. So I hope that explained that a little bit for you, Frank. Sure it does. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you for that question, because that really was a question that that one of our students had with us last year, and so that's how our um, our um, meeting title got the phrase was based off a really good conversation that we had with one of our students who graduated this year. So, any other questions? <laughs> any other questions? <laughs> Tanya, my name is Connie Martin. My Indian name is Adelita. I'm from the Lummi Nation, and I never thought of it the way you're saying about um, how we quantify who we are. Hi, Connie. I'm sorry. Um, you're kind of coming in and out with your... What we can provide. I, I don't know if you can hear me. I, we're having a hard time with our... But having children in attending Northwest Union College presently... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, you're kind of coming in and Can you hear it now? Better. Tanya, can you hear me now? I just importance of not only elders, but of people that work in the schools to help walk them through getting into education is so important right now. And I'm hoping with the people they have at College, can get a lot to assist them to be successful. Thank you, Connie. Thank you for your comment. So as we get ready to wrap up, 
I just wanted to ask and put it out there to those that are so with us. If there's someone who would be willing to close us out with a closing blessing. This is Frank, I will. Thank you, Frank. Let's look to our Heavenly Father. How uh, Solana, how she gained your great spirit today. We thank you for the day that you have given us. We thank you for the circle that you have made. We pray that you give us the ability to share with each other our knowledge, things that we know, things that we need to do, things that we need to learn so that we can be a help to our people. Our people look to us just as we look to them. As they look on us, they give us strength, which we share back with them. I want to give thanks for the people who have set up this meeting so that they could share, bring people together to share, to help each other. Let us, let us remember that when we are elected to positions within the tribe or the native organizations, we're not elected to lead, but we are elected to serve. And that's what we've come here today so we can better serve our people. We pray for those that could not make it today, those that are sick, those that are traveling. Pray for our troops, for our government, that they will understand what the people of color, the people who really need the help, that they will open their, their ears and their eyes and their hearts. And so today, as we leave, let us bless each other until we meet come again tomorrow. Koyana, 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 pak. Gonna cheese, gonna cheese, hawa, hawa. Amen. Thank you, Frank, for your beautiful words. So, folks, if you're able to uh, join us tomorrow, it's going to be the same link. And we're, like I said, we're going to have a raffle at the end of our session. And we've got some beautiful presenters that are willing to share their knowledge with us tomorrow. So thank you for joining us today. And I hope you have a really awesome, blessed afternoon. So thank you. Buongiorno. <laughs> thank you, Frank. That's my signature goodbye. <laughs> I love it. <laughs>